Hello, my name is Nicholas Stanford, and I am a philosophy and music education major from SUNY Buffalo State College. I was a recipient of an undergraduate summer research fellowship in 2021 from my college. And this fellowship was to conduct research on my topic, Can Music Alone Cause an Emotion? An investigation into Jennifer Robinson's Deeper Than Reason under the mentorship of Dr. Lee Duffy from the philosophy department. So the reason why I am recording my presentation and sending it in today is because I am currently living in Siena, Italy as part of the IPDS Siena student teaching program at Buffalo State College. Uh, I am a music teacher and I am teaching uh, K through 10 general music here at the International School. On the left is a picture of me in front of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in the middle is a picture of Siena, where I am teaching. And on the right is my teacher ID badge. I had interest in this research topic starting in the fall of 2018 when I took Dr. Duffy's Philosophy 300 Emotions class. I presented my final paper from this class at uh, Buffalo State's Philosophy Department's Spring Colloquia Series in spring 2019. And then I pursued my philosophy honors thesis in this discipline starting in the spring of 2021. Okay, so what is an emotion? There are two leading views on this that are the physicalist view and the cognitivist view. Uh, physicalist view is also sometimes thought of as a James Lane theory, which holds that emotions in their essences are purely physiological changes. To the physicalists, physical sensations are necessary, but not sufficient to having an emotion. The Shatter Singer view argues that having both physiological sensations and an intentional object of cognition is necessary, but not sufficient to having an emotion. In their 1962 study, participants were injected with epinephrine to stimulate the physiological changes necessary to the physicalist theory. Then, participants were placed in two different rooms. Both rooms had an actor, one who was to act euphoric and excited, and another who was to act angry and aggressive. Though both sets of participants received the same epinephrine doses and likely experienced the same physical symptoms, their reported emotions were different. Group one's overall emotional state was euphoric like their actors. Group two's overall emotional state was nervous or angry, similar to their actor's emotion. From this study arose a cognitivist theory. More recently, Jennifer Robinson's book, Deeper Than Reason, outlined an extensive emotional process that claims the one necessary component to having an emotion is a non-cognitive physical reaction either to an external or internal stimulus, which she calls an effective appraisal. Her effective appraisal serves as the intermediary between cognition and physical sensation when having an emotion. In doing so, she rejects the cognitivist theory as, one, as the one necessary component of emotions in her view is non-cognitive. To Robinson, music acts similarly to the epinephrine and chatter and singers two-factor cognitivist study, causing physical mood states rather than actual emotions. Robinson explains that mood states are states of being with characteristic physiological feelings of emotions, but no effective appraisal to transition, to transition rather the sensations into real emotions. Examples of these mood states include feeling calm, or feeling restless. I disagree with Robinson's assistance about the importance of non-cognitive effective appraisals over cognition. I think the emotional process that can occur with music is different than the typical non-musically prompted human emotional response. Investigating this musical emotional experience can shed light on our emotional process as a whole. And so I sought out to investigate the human emotional process with music through research. My research questions included the following. To which extent can music alone cause emotions in a listener? And what are the effects of differing cognitive objects on musically prompted emotional experiences? 
Inspired by Robinson's interactions with prior research on emotions, my research was designed to resemble the Shatter and Singer study. Conducted 100% online through Qualtrics, 76 participants were separated into three study groups and asked to self-report their current emotional state given a chart of emotions. Then each group was asked to listen to the same piece of music. What distinguished each group was what they did before listening to the music. While group one proceeded directly into their listening, groups two and three were primed by watching a short video that strongly expressed a singular emotional state. After watching the video, these participants were directed to listen to the piece of music. If Robinson were correct, the selected music would work in a similar way to the epinephrine, causing physical changes in the body and putting the listener in a mood state. To take on the role of Shatter and Singer's euphoric and angry emotional actors, I selected two video primers that selected that strongly expressed specific emotional states, euphoric, euphoria, and sadness. The euphoric video featured an undergraduate student who won $11,111 in a basketball competition. The sad video showed a young boy from Syria who was injured and in shock from a war bombing. Participants were prompted to answer specific questions related to their physical and emotional sensations while listening to the music. Finding and selecting a piece of music to use in the study was a purposeful and extensive process. Like Robinson, I wanted to explore emotional expression within purely instrumental music, as instrumental selections could explain if music alone caused emotions. The piece I chose is titled Reminiscence, composed by Olafur Arnolds. It is based on Frederick Chopin's Nocturne in C-sharp minor and was released relatively recently as part of a recording titled The Chopin Project. Modeling Robinson's musical analysis for emotional content, I analyzed this music for its melodic form, melodic material, rhythm, harmonic development, chromaticism, expressive qualities, and melodic persona. Here are two images of my musical transcription and analysis of Reminiscence. I transcribed this piece by ear, and then compared my transcription to the version Arnold has on his website. I noticed some differences between what was performed and what he notated. And in comparing both transcriptions, came up with what I believe to be the most accurate representation of what my participants actually heard. Using JavaScript coding, I programmed these four questions to appear to my participants at different moments during the five minute piece of music. I inquired about participants physical sensations two minutes into the music, and participants' emotional responses and cognition four minutes into the music. This was purposeful due to the way reminiscence thematically developed. Essentially, the first two minutes are quiet and without much melodic content. Then, between the two minutes and four minutes of the music, the music builds in intensity and melodic material, reaching its expressional peak at the four minute marker. Robinson states that it is not surprising that in moments of intense emotional experience occur, rather, Robinson states that it is not surprising that moments of intense emotional experience occur at moments of high tension in music. Music affects our autonomic and motor system in various ways. If participants were to be emotionally moved by the music, it would be at this moment and thus the final three questions were programmed to appear at this time. I also asked participants to self-report their current emotional state post-listening. Then participants answered these questions. Close to 99% of participants physically reacted to reminiscence, regardless of if they had watched the video before listening to the piece. The physical sensations reported aligned with feeling either relaxed or feeling tense. These physical results make it clear that reminiscence caused distinctive physical sensations and these sensations were expected from my musical analysis. Here is a chart I made outlining the trends and emotional responses while listening to music. Now, uh, if you look 
I have LEN, LEP, HEN, and HEP in the chart. Um, this aligns with um, the emotion chart that's on your left. And uh, LEN stands for low energy negative, bottom left. LEP, low energy positive, bottom right. High energy negative, HEP, top left. And high energy positive, top right. Note that the majority of those in groups one and two had positive emotional responses, while the majority in group three were negative. Additionally, there were far more low energy negative emotional responses in group three than in any other group. Those from group three who thought about the SAD video primer provided the greatest correlation between emotion and cognitive trend among all participant groups. All other participant emotion groups, including low energy negative, rather low energy positive, high energy negative, and high energy positive, varied in their cognitions and provided no observable data trends. Additionally, those low energy negative participants from group three who wrote about something related to the video primer wrote lengthier and more direct responses than others in the study. For example, here are three responses from the low energy negative group three participants. Now, here are three responses from low energy positive participants in group three. Due to my analysis of reminiscence, it seemed that the single emotion expressed by the music was sadness. This being said, there are also calm, intense expressional qualities within the music itself. These musical qualities seem to be the ones that cause mood states within listeners across all three groups, represented through participants categorized as having low energy positive or high energy negative feelings. These mood state participants were most prevalent in group one and group two, totaling almost 80% of participants. Group three told a different emotional story than other participant groups. While some group three participants experienced low energy positive and high energy negative mood states, the majority of participants experienced emotions that can be categorized as low energy negative. Additionally, rather than use physical words and descriptions, these participants provided more cognitively complex emotion words like solemn, disappointed, and sad. Demographically, there was nothing that separated the low energy negative group three participants from the rest of the sample. Instead, what clearly distinguished the group three participants in the low energy negative category was the nature of what was on their mind. Thoughts related to the sad video primer. This research suggests that the pairing of expressional music and an emotionally related cognitive thought is necessary to having an emotion with music. In this instance, the emotional nature of reminiscence was sad, and physically the music had the ability to cause either relaxation or tension within a listener. Paired with, emotionally, paired with an emotionally related sad video, a listener who was focused on the Syrian boy's story while listening experienced an actual emotion, sadness. While Robinson's effective appraisal is sufficient for causing an emotion, it might not be necessary when having an emotion with music. More research should be done with regards to this kind of emotional process. What role the effective appraisal plays in those who are actually having an emotion with music and the necessary nature of cognition when having a musically induced emotion. The results in this study support my thesis, which states that necessary to having an emotion with music was the pairing of expressional music and an emotionally related evaluative cognitive event. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any additional questions, I'm always happy to answer them via email. Uh, my email address is, uh, as you see, uh, Dr. Duffy also has this address and I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.